Good evening. Thank you, Father Loic and uh, Dean Professor Catherine Drost for your gracious words of introduction. At the Dominican University in Ibadan, we begin our Senate meetings with a prayer for wisdom found in the Book of Wisdom, Chapter 9. And having been asked to say the opening prayer and the closing prayer at this lecture, I've chosen to begin by saying the same prayer. It's a prayer for wisdom from the Book of Wisdom, Chapter 9. God of our ancestors, Lord of mercy, who by your word have made all things and in your wisdom have fitted human beings to rule the creatures that have come from you, to govern the world in holiness and justice and in honesty of soul to wield authority. Grant us wisdom, concert of your throne. And do not reject us from among the number of your children. For we are your servants, children of your serving maid, feeble, with little time to live, with small understanding of justice and the laws. Indeed, were anyone perfect among us, if he lacked the wisdom that comes from you, he would still count for nothing. With you is wisdom, she who knows your works, she who was present when you made the world. She understands what is pleasing in your eyes and what agrees with your commandments. <clears throat> Dispatch her from the holy heavens, send her forth from your throne of glory to help us and to toil with us and teach us what is pleasing to you, since she knows and understands everything. She will guide us prudently in our undertakings and protect us by her glory. Amen. I'm immensely grateful to the International Dominican Foundation and to the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome for appointing me to hold the Val Marquinez Chair this academic year. And I earnestly hope that our encounter will be the beginning of a long standing and mutually beneficial relationship between this university and the Dominican University in Ibadan where I serve as professor and rector. Licensed in 2016, the Dominican University in the ancient city of Ibadan is the first university of the order, the order of preachers on the African continent. Providentially, it was established on the 800th anniversary of the founding of the order. And I must also remark that uh, providentially, these thoughts I'm going to share with you on university education are being shared in the same aula where Pope St. John Paul II defended his doctoral thesis in 1948. I still recall with great admiration the thoughts he shared with the Nigerian university community in 1982 when he said mass on the grounds of the University of Ibadan, Nigeria's oldest university. My involvement in the establishment of the Dominican University, alongside my Dominican conference in Nigeria and some of our friends, challenged, inspired, and encouraged me to envision what a Dominican university ought to look like. It is this vision I would like to share with you in this lecture. I'd like to begin with a passing autobiographical remark, which somewhat situates, illustrates, and summarizes my thoughts. I come from southwestern Nigeria, 
where I was born six decades ago, and where I had my early education, that is kindergarten and primary education. The predominantly spoken language in southwestern Nigeria is Yoruba. It is the language of the ethnic community to which I belong. And I had the privilege of receiving my early education in two languages, in English and in Yoruba. I acquired the French language in secondary school, and now I am learning to say a few words in Italian. <laughs> in the early years of my education in southwestern Nigeria, the day would usually begin with a poem set into a song, which we would sing as we marched into the classroom. The one that comes to my mind as I share these thoughts with you is entitled Iwe Kiko. I'm sure you'll learn some Yoruba at the end of today's lecture. Iwe Kiko. It says, Iwe Kiko, La Isioko, Atiada, Koikbeo, Koikbeo. Ishe Agbe, Nishe Ilewa. Eni koshishe amajale. Tradutory, traditory. If one were to subscribe to that saying, found in a collection of Tuscan proverbs by the 19th century writer Giuseppe Giusti, that every translator is, in a way, a traitor, translating this nursery rhyme or any African adage into any language of the global north would be a notoriously laborious exercise. Nonetheless, for the purpose of communication, I shall endeavor to explain, if not accurately translate. By way of an approximate translation, it says, book knowledge without a hole and without a cutlass two famous farming implements in sub-Saharan Africa would be incomplete. In concrete terms, theory without praxis would be insufficient. Intellectual knowledge without practice would be incomplete. It would be a violation of the integrity of education. There is thus in this Yoruba nursery rhyme of seductive simplicity, a vision of education that cannot be ignored. What this vision of education is and how it can have a Dominican expression, that is my objective in this discourse. A vision of education must be consistent with our understanding of what it means to be human and our understanding of what it means to be human shapes our understanding of what development is. And so the first moment of my discourse is to explain the purpose of education implicit in that nursery rhyme. And the point I'm trying to make is the purpose of education is to build. Of vital importance for the purpose of this discourse is the Yoruba verb, ko. I'm sure you heard that over and over again. Iwe ki ko la isioko. And this may be translated into English as to learn or to teach or to educate. In that respect, to deliver a lecture, as I am doing now, is to give an idani le ko. But the Yoruba verb ko could also mean build. To educate, therefore, is to build a human person. The purpose of education is to build the human person who will in turn build the society. The human person who is being built does not live in isolation, but is, as Aristotle would say, a political animal. That is an animal whose natural habitat is a life lived in common and intelligently regulated in the quest 
for the common good. He is built, that is, educated, to actualize his potential by working for the actualization of our collective potential. He is educated to work for the common good by working for his own good, and to work for his own good by working for the common good. What is at stake here is the understanding that society is built by building the human person. And the human person is built by building the society. For there is no human society without human beings, and there is no human being who lives or thrives outside a society, that is, outside a life lived in common. Discernible here is a three-way relationship between education, the human person, and development. The way education is envisaged, the way what it means to be human is understood, and the way development of a society is understood exists in a three-way relationship. There is a relationship between the notion of education, the notion of the human person, and the notion of development. Education is the tool for human development. Our vision of education in general, of university education in particular, is of crucial importance for the attainment of developmental goals in what we love to call today the global village a global village which, if I may be permitted, I shall call a global society, given the imperatives of international, interregional, intercontinental, intercultural, and interracial collaboration today. In this respect, we cannot overlook the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us that in this global village, not to collaborate in the search for the good is to self-destruct. The task before us, given the inseparable relationship between our notions of education, the human person, and development, is to rediscover an integral humanism and protect it by preserving the integrity of education. St. Thomas Aquinas is known to have been insistent in asserting that the human being fully realizes himself in education, in the realization of his intellectual potential. <clears throat> he divides the sciences into mathematics, physics, and metaphysics. Today, an overwhelming majority of theorists of education do not speak in exactly those terms. Nonetheless, the validity of his repeated assertion remains. The assertion only has to be made in the language of our contemporaries, in the language our contemporaries understand, so that in these days as we speak of synodality, we may truly walk together towards an integral humanism that finds its inspiration, motivation, and nourishment in the integrity of education. After St. Thomas in the 13th century, St. John Henry Newman had in the 19th envisioned that knowledge is a vast field divided into three provinces, namely knowledge of nature, knowledge of the human person, and knowledge of God, that is, into natural sciences, human and social sciences, and theological sciences. His vision of natural sciences would include the STEM courses of today, as they are called, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Newman's vision of human and social sciences would include literature, history, and philosophy. 
His vision of theological sciences would include the spiritual dimensions of human existence, the ground on which everything stands, the relation of the human being to God, who is the author and goal of his creatures. In an overwhelming majority of universities today, one can perceive a shift of emphasis and priority from the sapiential mindset of St. Thomas and St. John Newman to the technocratic mindset of instrumentalized reason. The numerous and wondrous accomplishments of science and technology would seem to justify the attribution of paradigmatic and imperial status to mathematical and empirical sciences. Such justification would seem to have received corroboration in what transpired during the global lockdown occasioned by the COVID-19 pandemic. In what looks like a verdict on the relevance of science and technology and on the irrelevance of any religion that lays claims to the supernatural, the world witnessed weeks and months during which churches and other places of worship were on lockdown. And religious leaders appeared to be idle, while hospitals and laboratories, doctors and nurses were at work. Scientists were busy looking for a cure, or at least for a vaccine, while priests, pastors, and prophets were seemingly out of service, presumed to be incapable of making any contribution to the global response to the pandemic. Today, while the mathematical and empirical sciences are taken as paradigm and imperial in many universities, Predilection for the STEM courses seems to have led human and theological sciences to dive for cover in the fireworks of the sciences, to be on the defensive when it comes to their right to belong to and to be heard in the Committee of Sciences. Their defect, if it is a defect, is that they fail the test of imperiology and empiricism is the membership card of today's university. Strong is the temptation to exclude literature, history, philosophy, and theology from the academia. And increasingly, many a university succumb to this seemingly irresistible temptation. The STEM courses attract more grants and bring in more funds necessary to develop a university at a time many universities, especially in countries of the global south, such as my beloved Nigeria, are finding it increasingly difficult to find much needed financial resources for their operations. As a result, there are universities that are either reducing budgetary allocation to or are shutting down altogether programs in the humanities, including philosophy and theology. It is my contention that this way of envisioning education violates its integrity, and such violation is detrimental to the human person and to society. Education must be at the service of human dignity we must therefore understand the human person who is to be served by education if we are to have a vision of education that will serve the human person and society. If our vision of education were to represent a violation of the integrity of education because it does not take into consideration the human person in his or her integrality, we would run the risk of living in a world of science 
without conscience. A world that will ironically be annihilated by its own accomplishments. We must therefore seek to understand the human person, the primary beneficiary of education. The many crises and conflicts faced in the past and in the present of our global village, with the real and present danger that we shall continue to face them in the future, invite and challenge us to identify and build the human person who will build a new world as artisan of a civilization of love. This will lead us to identify the type of development the world is in need of, the type of education needed to build, to build builders of this new global village, and the imperative of ensuring that citizens of this global village have access to good quality education so envisioned, so that they can become true and effective artisans of the village we ought to have. I come to a brief description of the human person as beneficiary and agent of authentic development. Manufacturers model their products on their customers, that is on human beings who will use them. And this is an example to be followed in envisioning education. There is thus a need to have a portrait of the human beneficiary of education who will in turn become beneficiary and agent of authentic development. In this respect, I shall speak of four traits that distinguish the human person from lower creatures, traits that represent fundamental orientations in the human person. First, the human person naturally yearns for and is able to know the truth because the human person is endowed by the Creator with an intellective power that tends to the truth, even if we sometimes deceive or are sometimes deceived, no one likes to be deceived. Secondly, the human person naturally yearns for the good because the Creator has endowed him with a will whose natural inclination is to the good, the good as understood by the intellect. Thirdly, the human person naturally desires God. It's a desire that is identifiable in the fact that the truth and the good which human beings naturally desire and which human beings are able to attain are beyond what is found in transient and finite realities. Only God can satisfy the deepest longing in the human person. It is the human yearning for God that is at the root of the desire for the truth and the good. Fourthly, the human person desires to love and be loved. The most important statement about God in the Bible, I dare say, is God is love. The God whom the human person naturally desires is love. In the desire to love and be loved is the desire for God. Upon reflection on what it is to be human, one is or one ought to be able to discern that the human being is not just one who is defined by production and consumption. The human being is defined by other dimensions, by an intellectual dimension in and through which the truth is sought and attained, by a moral dimension <clears throat> in and through which the good is desired and attained, 
an Intel which is built a technical dimension to which production and consumption are related. And the human being is characterized by a spiritual dimension in which God is desired and found in the experience of loving and being loved. In an encounter with what Martin Buber has called the human Tao, which serves as a medium of a real encounter with the divine Tao. It is in fact the case that the aspirations of the intellectual, moral, and technical order cannot be satisfied except in a life lived in common with other human beings. And what has been said so far enables us to briefly elaborate a corresponding notion of development and a corresponding vision of education. Development in the proper sense of the word is actualization of the potential and fulfillment of the desires of the human person in each of the four dimensions I have so far identified. Intellectual development is attained when the human desire to know the truth is fulfilled in the actualization of the human potential to know the truth. Moral development is attained when the human desire for the good is fulfilled in the actualization of the human capacity to attain the good. It is attained when knowledge that is attained by the intellect is applied to human action in the collaboration of the intellect and the will in the human quest for the good. Not to be dissociated from moral development is technical development, which is the fulfillment of the human desire to apply knowledge to matters of production and consumption. The dangerous alternative to technical development disconnected from moral development would be the error of disconnecting our consumptive instinct and productive capacity from the moral order. Spiritual development underlies all this. It is the fulfillment of the natural desire for God in the actualization of the human capacity to know and love God. It is the ordering of life by one's relationship with God, by a life of faith ennobling and enabling reason. It is what happens when the human intellect encounters the mystery of God and the encounter brings the human being to his or her knees in humble adoration of the God encountered. I'm fond of saying to our theology students in Nigeria that the goal of theology is to bring the theologian to his or her knees in humble adoration. Pope St. Paul VI, in his landmark encyclical Populorum Progressio, wisely counsels the world not to reduce development to the good of the market, to maximization of production, construction, and consumption in the achievements of science and technology. The reductionism <clears throat> about which he prophetically warns the world is rooted in a monstrous misconception of the human person as one whose fulfillment can only be found in production and consumption. Perhaps if that warning had been heeded, the warning in the encyclical Laudato Si of Pope Francis regarding threat to the environment would not have been necessary. The extent to which we avoid the delusion of fulfillment only in economic progress is the extent to which we avoid a notion of development that would offer only rising economic, scientific, and technological indices. It is never too late to acknowledge that authentic development includes, but is not limited to economic, 
scientific and technological development. To avoid the abyss of science without conscience, the development of the whole person must be seen as technical, moral, intellectual, and spiritual. Economic, scientific, and technological development is inseparable from fulfillment of the natural yearning for the truth, that is, intellectual development. It is inseparable from the fulfillment of the natural yearning for the good, that is, moral development, and it is inseparable from the fulfillment of the natural yearning for God, that is, in spiritual development. Anything short of this leads to the formation of fragmented individuals. This vision of authentic development is sustained by a philosophical and theological anthropology, an understanding of human nature inspired and enlightened by divine revelation in intelligently received, or rather, an account of human nature informed by faith and reason. Inseparable from this is the anthropological conviction that a human person counts more than economic prosperity. In concrete terms, what makes us human it's not just the fact that we desire and can produce what to eat and drink. Authentic human existence is not just a matter of satisfaction. It is ultimately a matter of values. I return to the idea of education to present my vision of Dominican University education. I return to the idea of education as building by referring to another Yoruba adage which says, Translated into English, it means build human beings, do not build houses. Of course we need houses. We need human beings to build houses, to build homes and cities, to build a civilization. But we must first build the human person. A related adage says, Again, by way of an approximative translation and or explanation, this is saying, the child we fail to build will one day put up for sale the houses we have built. Or the child we fail to educate will one day squander all the riches we have acquired. In practical terms, if we do not build human beings, whatever we build will sooner or later decay and collapse like a pack of cards but a human being must be built in all those dimensions I've tried to explain. Here then is an adage that counsels us to prioritize the building of the human person over and above construction of structures. The vision of development I've attempted to present calls us to educate, that is to build human beings, not just to build structures. St. Thomas speaks of how action must be informed by good use of reason, and that reason itself must be informed by faith. He says science in general has knowledge of things in and through their causes. These, and this description of the office of the wise person as one who searches for wisdom by searching for the universal cause of things, point in the direction of education as a union of knowledge and wisdom. Here, therefore, 
I appropriate St. Thomas by proposing a vision of education that marries faith and reason, theory and praxis, sciencia and sapientia. Whereas St. Thomas saw knowledge as more than possession of empirically verifiable facts, today there seems to be a unanimity that knowledge is to be reduced to empirically verifiable facts. Sciencia is reduced to acquisition of facts. But for us, sapientia is knowledge of facts in and through knowledge of what causes them to be. What causes them to be facts in the first instance? For it is one thing to acquire facts, to be in possession of data, it is another thing to understand the data we have acquired. We acquire so much data playing around with our handset, with our computers, but it's one thing to acquire data, it's another thing to understand what we have acquired. The former is the province of knowledge in the restrictive sense of today's academia. The latter is the province of wisdom, which is knowledge of why facts are facts. Today, the marginalization of sapientia by science and technology would make us have a vision of education that violates the integrity of education and militates against an integral humanism. A recognition and acknowledgement of the fact that a human being is to be built, that is, educated in all the dimensions of human existence. But the academia, the society and the church today are in need of a vision of integral humanism and integral education if our graduates are to become agents of authentic development. By integral humanism, I mean the promotion of the dignity of the human person in his or her spiritual, intellectual, moral, and technical dimensions. By integral education, I mean education that forms the human person in these same dimensions. The vision of a university I'm therefore proposing is African, Catholic, and Dominican. It is African because education so envisioned, like the traditional African cooking stove, which is made of three stones, stands on three feet. Intellectual formation, ethical formation, technical formation. It is a project of Catholic, that is integral education, because its objective is to form the whole person. So it stands on three feet, like three feet of the African stove, and these three, these three are intellectual formation or formation for truth, moral formation or formation for the good, and technical formation or formation for mat mat managerial competence, inventions, creativity, Education cannot stand without any of the three feet, and the three feet stand on the ground of spiritual formation. This vision is also informed and illustrated by the Dominican life of prayer and study. A life in which one desires God, stays tuned to God and to the human person in the quest for the best way to live together. It corresponds to the Dominican quest for spiritual and intellectual formation in their interwovenness. A quest for God in a quest for truth and a quest for good in pursuit of personal realization and communal self-realization. Here in this vision of interwovenness of spiritual and intellectual formation, is a concrete expression of the Dominican tradition of prayer and study. It is in the quest for the truth that God is that 
we human beings find our liberty. And this influenced the coining, the formulation of the motto of the Dominican University in Ibadan, in veritate libertas. This vision of authentic, this vision of education for authentic development evokes the spirit of Pope St. Paul VI Popularum Progressio, an encyclical whose Dominican fingerprints are visible. It is an encyclical in which Paul VI wisely admonished our modern world not to limit development to the provision of technical infrastructure while ignoring the human person. Development, and by extension education, is about the human person. For this reason, our global village cannot be left in the hands of technocrats alone. It requires the formation of a new generation of agents of civilization, men and women of spiritual, intellectual, ethical, and technical competence, present and actively deploying this multiple competence in every sphere of human endeavor in the search for the common good. The cultivation of spiritual and intellectual life will express itself in a well-cultivated moral life placed at the service of the common good. Education today must include the acquisition of technical competence at the same time as spiritual, intellectual, and moral competence. For while technical competence is necessary, it is of itself insufficient. The driver's seat of authentic development must be occupied by those who desire the truth, the good, and technical efficiency in the love of God above all things and the love of neighbor created in the image and likeness of God. When St. Dominic founded the order of preachers, he placed the order at the service of the church's mission of preaching the truth. This truth is not a proposition or a collection of propositions that would reduce truth to an ideology and the order and her universities would then become institutions established to propagate an ideology. The truth the Dominican order and her universities must serve is a person. And that person is God who became incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth. History recalls that the order's early preachers and thinkers played a pioneering and pivotal role in the development of Europe. History testifies to the immense intellectual output of St. Thomas Aquinas and of his teacher, St. Albert the Great. Today, the Dominican order has its universities on all the continents. Their mission is to serve the preaching mission of the order by using the gospel to refine and rectify reason and technique. In a meeting point of religion, philosophy, science, and technology. In a symposium of faith, reason, science, and technology. In a constant conversation of theory and praxis. Today's Dominican universities must undertake the task of forming future leaders, men and women of multiple competence, to occupy the driver's seat in the global quest for authentic development. If, as I have asserted, the purpose of education is to build the human person who will in turn build the society as agent of authentic development, it has to be added that this purpose is attained when the human person is educated 
in his or her integrality. The Dominican intellectual tradition in its interwovenness and synthesis of spiritual, intellectual, and ethical formation invites us to envision a university as a place where technocrats with ethical competence are formed. Investing in human capital is not simply reducible to a matter of augmenting the productive and acquisitive capacity of the human person in matters material. It is about forming the human being to seek the good in every dimension of existence. Every Dominican university must lead civilization in this direction. I thank you for listening. Thank you.